the first thing I want to orient you to is how it's organized. So you'll notice tabs on the bottom. It goes from left to right. You'll go through this sheet from left to right, and that's what I'm going to do. But think about it as like painting a, painting a fence or a wall. You're going to go back and forth uh, when you use this tool. And what, I want to, what I'm going to do is show you why and orient you to um, how these different tools, and there's a reason that they're ordered the way they are, um, how they, the, the rhyme to the, re, the reason to the rhyme here and how to use this tool to calculate your working capital. So the first tab really is just instructions. Um, you know, first of all, uh, there's comments and cells that help you with it. They also refer to the guide right here, and you have that available to download tonight. They also give you the code to unlock cells right here. There's a lot of locked formulas in here. So if you're an Excel geek and you want to unlock the formulas or mess around with them, which I don't recommend, but it's got all those instructions here. I'm not going to read it to you, but the first step is really how to use the tool and some tips. The first page is your starting point. So the first page is a nice, easy to use uh, worksheet that helps you estimate startup capital. Remember we talked about startup capital. So it has some common categories for businesses. Um, you know, fixed assets like buildings, equipment, furniture, vehicles, if you're going to buy them, what have you. Um, so anything that falls into the fixed asset category and there's another category in here. So, you, you know, you simply put numbers in here based on your, your planning and it, it's going to add it up like Excel does well um, to help you out there. So you should spend some time on us. This should be the easiest sheet to use. And you're going to go through the same step for operating capital, you know, pre-opening salaries and wages, prepaid insurance premiums. These are all the things we're going to spend money in that stage where we're planning the business and we haven't cut the yellow ribbon yet. Things like deposits and legal and accounting fees, things like that that you see here, licenses. Um, all of that is in here. Now, this yellow cell is the most important cell in this entire workbook. Okay, I'm going to set this to zero. Notice why it's so important. Because it's working capital. Okay, I'm going to show you how that cell will make or break your day, uh, make your day or not as we go through the model. So I'm going to set it to zero for now. And, um, you know, this totals up your operating capital. And this is total required funds is your operating capital plus your fixed asset requirements. You add those two together and that gives you your that first number that we need, right? That startup capital number. See how easy it is to figure that out? <laughs> Simple, simple. So we'll get into uh, why working capital is a little bit more hard, uh, harder to figure out how much you need. This section is sources of funding. So that these are the different options we've actually talked about in modules prior to this. So you can actually model different sources of capital uh, using this part of the tool. So you can, you know, try to get a vehicle loan. Um, try to get a, a, a loan, a commercial loan. So say, you know, you can put any number you want. So say I want to get a three hundred fifty thousand dollar loan at at uh, you know nine percent on a seven year term or you know a, a ten year term, wherever you want to put in here, and it'll calculate your monthly payments. The cool thing about this part of the tool, you'll see a link over here. See loan amortization and depreciation schedule. If you click on that, it's going to bring you way way over to the right um, in this workbook. Right here, amortization depreciation. It'll bring you to this page and actually break down in detail what your loan payments are on the different sources of capital. And that it does that automatically. Again, that's a powerful part of this tool. And it's linked to that first page. So if I click here, I go back to the first page. I go back and forth. So that's a pretty neat part of this tool. And again, you pay big bucks for other tools to integrate this type of calculation for you. So I just kind of threw some stuff in here. I think this was 200,000. Um, but as you can see, you can model different sources of funding in here as you continue to plan to finance your business and apply some of the lessons we've learned in the first couple of modules. Uh, this is for existing businesses only. I'm not going to touch on that tonight, but there's a couple of extra ways you put in stuff that's already exists in the business in this section. So just to summarize this tab, this is your starting point. It's the easiest tab to use. 
Uh, you know, you put some thought into how much money you're going to spend on what as you crank up the business, that startup capital. I'd suggest you leave the working capital blank. You'll see why in a minute. But this is pretty straightforward. Mike, anything to add? One thing I would add is, is that existing businesses only piece down there. If you're um, buying a business, then you might use that. Um, and it also has some cool features, too. The other thing I wanted to add is um, the instruction manual that John talked about. Uh, it is voluminous, believe me. It, it is many, many pages that goes into great detail. And um, personally, I think that's an upside for this because it does explain it in such great detail. So keep that in mind that if you're going to take a look at the your uh, the manual you may be overwhelmed but don't let it overwhelm you thank you john yeah and, and you know come back to the recording of what we're doing right now and just you know reference that as you go through this so we're going to go through this and then make a couple of points as we do but um you know between this right now live the recording and the manual you will master this tool trust me so the second tab is around payroll payroll typically is the greatest expense of any business so this allows you to actually play around with uh you know how many employees you're going to have what, what you're going to pay them per hour and you know you just do um you, you know planning and this allows you to plan for that and model what you think you're going to do um in the business and it helps you figure all that out and figure out your monthly pay per month here and then forecast that across the model um, and then it also will calculate taxes, and many of us don't factor this in. So there are standard tax rates for Social Security, Medicare, state unemployment tax, depending on what state you're in. Um, and if you have any of these coverages like health insurance and stuff like that or a benefits program, this allows you to uh, factor that in. And, you know, if you have a, a benefit program, for example, uh, you might want to put something in here that, you know, re reflects the cost of that program, you know, or not if you're a, a brand new startup. But this allows you to f figure out what your staffing is going to be in year one. The tool for years one through three, by the way, this does a three year projection. Uh, so for years two and three, it's simply inputting what the increases from year one are. So in this example, uh, I'm saying I'm going to increase my full time headcount by 30 percent in year two and 30% in year three, you know, I could change this to 20%. Um, you know, you get the drift here, right? So that thinking about your growth rate in terms of headcount, you can model that in years two and three. You don't have to do it on a monthly basis like years one, year one. So that's for payroll. Most businesses need to factor that in. The second one, the next section, section three, is your sales forecast. It works the same way. You spend a lot of time and detail on year one, and years two and three are a percentage of year one. But um, So you want to spend a lot of time on this. In this example, uh, to make a point, I'm going to say that in our first three months, so first of all, let me start at the top, you model your product lines. You might have one product line. You might have multiple product lines. In this example, I have three products, and I have a service offering. You have how many units of that product you're going to put in here, an estimate, what the sales price is per unit, and COGS, which is cost of goods sold, um, is uh, is the cost of that product. And if you do what you, the tip says, you, you click this link, there's a tool in the back, uh, much like the amortization schedule, it's right next to it. It gives you a little tool here to figure out what your uh, – cost of goods sold are if you need some help with that. So we're back to where we started. And uh, this determines your margin per unit. The margin is your sales price minus your cost. That's your margin. So it figures all that out for you. And then you go through this sheet and you put some thought in, okay, here's how, how much of product A I'm going to sell. Here's how much of product B I'm going to sell and what months I'm going to sell it. And again, this is a forecast. Reality will be different. So you want to be real conservative. And it will calculate all these, your sales numbers, your, your COGS, and your margin for each month for each product line, okay? And it'll total it here at the bottom. So this requires some time to think about 
what your sales ramp up's going to be and to model it using this sheet. Once you've done that, you go to the next step, which is years two and three. You want to do the same thing you did with employees. You want to model um, percentage increase right here, your growth rate from year one to year two, and your growth rate from year two to year three. You put whatever you think it's going to be here. Again, we, we'd suggest that you're conservative, and whatever growth rate you put in here will uh, be reflected in the numbers on the sheet. I'm going to pause there, Mike. Anything to add there? Yeah, the big warning that I will share with everyone is garbage in, garbage out. You need to try and really be as accurate in your estimations as possible. Because um, if you put crappy numbers into this thing, then you're going to get crappy output. So spend some time. Uh, do it. Do it up correctly, and uh, you can always change it. It's not like you're locked in on anything, but do it up correctly, and you will be far ahead. Thank you, John. Thanks, Mike. And along those lines, uh, you want to be conservative, okay? Um, so if you're conservative, you're going to ramp up sales slower, and you're going to ramp up expenses faster than you think. That's a conservative approach um, because that's going to create – a more conservative estimate of what your uh, needs are, which we'll get to in a couple of minutes here. But anyway, uh, those are good advice, Mike, and part of the guiding principles of using this tool. So bear with me, folks. So the next tab is very important as well. So I've added this, uh, the words gas pedal and brake pedal. You won't see that in, in the plain version. And the reason for that is think about it as a gas pedal and a brake pedal. This represents your assumptions around two things. Number one, two important things. Number one, accounts receivable, days sales outstanding. That's a bunch of financial good terms to say, how fast am I going to be able to collect cash as I sell my product or service? Commonly referred to as day sales outstanding or DSO. If you're a retail operation and somebody comes in, picks up a product, goes to the cash register and buys it, your DSO is zero or one. Uh, you're not waiting for anything, right? If you're a landscaping company and you bill your clients monthly um, and then they take 30 days to pay you, your DSO is 30 days, okay? So um, that's why they have these categories here where you assume, you make some assumptions on this page about how fast people are going to pay you within 30 days, how fast, what percentage of the people, your customers are going to pay you between 30 and 60 days, and how, what percentage of the people will pay you over 90 days. So obviously, you have to be a genius to figure out the more people that pay you within 30 days, the faster the cash is going to come into the business, okay? And the more you can do with discounting, offering pricing models that provide a huge discount to pay up front, that's why you always get offered that in businesses, right? It's pretty common. The reason they're doing that is they want to get the cash in faster, and it's cheaper to discount the product than it is to pay for the financing to cover the cash that's missing while you get wait to get paid. So um, that's what this section is. This is this first section, accounts receivable, is what you'll be receiving for cash, okay? And this is cash coming into the business. And that's your gas pedal. The faster you can get uh, gas in the gas tank, the faster you can run the engine, okay? Accounts payable is the opposite. These are your bills. These are your bills to your suppliers, okay? So accounts payable is, you know, paying your suppliers, your subcontractors, things like that. Um, you know, if you keep paying your bills quick, 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 trying to be a, a, a good person, most people try to be on time with their bills. That's great, and that's good for you. But it's also sucking cash out of the business every time you pay a bill. So, again, you're going to go in here and make some assumptions about, how fast you're going to pay your bills. You're going to divide this up and how, what percentage of your bills you're going to pay within 30 days, what percentage between 30 and 60, and what percentage over 60. And you're going to do the same thing here. And you're going to do it for years one, two, and three. So this is a very important part of the model, which we'll, we'll come back to later to make a point. And um, you can also use the rest of this to say, you know what? Uh, in month 10, I'm going to buy a, a, another piece of land or I'm going to buy another piece of equipment that costs $25,000. 
if that's relevant to your business, you can use this part of the uh, sheet, this additional inputs for, to do like one-off purchases or uh, improvements in years two and three or the first part of year one that you know you're going to have to make. Um, this is the part of the model to put that stuff in. And then you're going to make some assumptions about taxes, okay, your tax rates. You can keep it at 20% for now, whatever it is. You have to have some tax rate, and it depends on the nature of your business. Some, um, I'll leave it at that, but just we're going to keep tax rates where they are. It depends on the nature of your business, what you should put in there. You should probably talk to an accountant about what's right for you there. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Mike, any comments on AR or AP and what I talked about there? Yeah, I, I the example that I always use from to clarify a, a accounts payable and accounts receivable is let's say you own a liquor store and uh, John is one of your big customers and you buy cases of Dom Perignon for John and you have to have them in the back room for John when he staggers in to buy another bottle. And then I'm also a customer and I drink military special. And so you have cases of that back there. Well, you have to pay your supplier theoretically faster than John comes in and buys bottles of his expensive Perignon and Dom Perignon. So that means that stuff is sitting on the shelf and you have to pay for it before John lays out any money to buy the bottles. And so that's the reason why John just said you need to look at uh, other models, because if you could get him to sign up for a subscription where he pays you for uh, another bottle every week, that means you could pay your supplier off and um, before John even comes and gets his bottle. So it, it's really cool um, figuring all this stuff out and, and using these tools to benefit you. But you've just got to think about it in simple terms. Thank you, John. Mike, you're always full of great analogies and examples that are really relevant. So I appreciate that. Uh, very creative when it comes to that stuff. Um, and that pile on to what Mike said. You know, sound like a geek, but this is actually the fun part of being an entrepreneur. You know, you'll go from your uh, yellow belt to your brown belt to your black belt as an entrepreneur as you master these concepts and you get more well versed on how cash flows and what levers you can pull and or push to, uh, you know, optimize cash flow. It's kind of a fun thing eventually, trust me, but it can be a little intimidating till you get there. So trust us, you'll figure it out. So let's move on. Uh, the next section is operating expenses. So operating expenses are simply, you know, expenses related to the business, whether you sell anything or not. So things like advertising are a good example, right? So you're going to put in here, I'm going to spend $1,500 a month when I first open up to get the word out. Then I'm going to throttle back to $500 a month. Uh, I'm going to buy a car and there's expenses like gas and maintenance and, and maybe a car payment I'm going to throw in here. Um, and just put a dollar amount in there, right? Um, I'm going to spend 1500 a month on contractors that aren't in the payroll calculations I just did. Uh, I've got insurance payments I need to make for commercial insurance. Uh, i got to pay the lawyer and other people um, on, a, on a monthly basis. That's the deal I cut with them. I have to spend 500 on licenses in month one. You get the gist of it, right? Rent's another common one that you got to factor in there. So you put in all your known expenses that have nothing to do with sales volume on this sheet. Okay. Um, you'll notice that this part right here uh, is, is not in yellow. That is because it, it's locked down. So these numbers you see here are actually automatically inputted into the model from whatever you put in your financing section back here at the starting point. So you'll see that I put a commercial loan in here. And, uh, you know, if I change this to 350, then I go back to my operating expenses, you'll see that the monthly payment changed. So what it's doing is it's automatically putting your, this is your principal, your interest payment, not the whole payment. It's just the interest part of your payment. 
The principal part actually gets recorded on the cash flow statement. I'll show you that later. But what, what this great model is doing automatically for you, it's pre-populating uh, that based on whatever you model here from your funding sources. So it, you know, it's one of the many reasons this thing is an awesome um, asset to have and to use and get used to. Again, for years one through three, it's the same thing. You go through every single category you put in a previous statement, and you just put a growth rate on a percentage basis for years two and three. So once you lock down, spend time on the first year uh, sections for each of the sections that I've gone through, your payroll, your sales, and your operating expenses, that's where you're going to spend your time in year one. Years one through three are just percentage increases. Uh, that you can come back to and adjust. So, Mike, um, any thoughts on operating expenses? No, you're good, John. Thank you. All right, so I've done that for years one and three. I just bumped it up three to 5%. Typically, operating expenses don't grow as fast as other expenses. It's just like cost of living. The price of everything goes up, right? Increase kind of rate, uh, you know, somewhere around 3 to 5% is a good number to use for operating expenses for your growth rate. Um, so just to summarize, we've put all these inputs in. We put an input in for payroll. We put an input in for our sales model. And we, and we talked about different ways of thinking about selling things, like Mike's eloquent example about my drinking habit. Uh, we talked about additional inputs in terms of assumptions about how fast cash is going to come in and how fast we're gonna pay our bills and cash is gonna go out. And then we also modeled our operating expenses. Um, the beautiful thing about that is this sheet uh, is you can't adjust at all, but what it does is it aggregates all those, those inputs up until this point and it creates your income statement. Now remember, this is the first of the three financial statements. Um, I've highlighted this myself to make a point, this is your gross margin. This is the difference between your cost of the goods that you've sold and your cost of goods sold. And, and um, the price of those goods and the cost of those goods is what's commonly known as the gross margin. Why that's important is you always want that number, that gross margin number, to be as close to or more than your operating expenses. So the difference between the gross margin and your operating expenses is your income um, before other expenses. And you can, that's what an income statement shows you. And then it deducts even further uh, expenses relating to your financing, okay, in this section down here. That's in amortization and depreciation. So I won't bore you with what all that is. And this automatically calculates your amortization and depreciation based on what you put in your starting point. So if you put equipment in here, it's actually amortizing and depreciating that automatically on these lines here. So it's another great reason. This is a great, powerful tool. So the difference between your income before other expenses and then you apply those expenses is your real income. And then that's what's taxed. And your bottom line is your bottom line. Uh, there's this thing called EBITDA. I'll just mention quickly. EBITDA, what EBITDA is, it adds back from this bottom line number. It adds back everything most everything in this section. Why would you do that? EBITDA is a common phrase used. It, it stands for earnings before uh, income taxes, depreciation, and amortization. That's what EBITDA stands for. It's an acronym. So what it does is it's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, not income taxes. Interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So because of that, you're adding that back in. Why do you do that? Well, for people that know what they're doing and evaluating business, EBITDA is a more accurate de determinant of how strong a business is because how you finance the business is usually a separate thing. To really measure the true performance of a business, it's based on EBITDA because um, that's just the way the world looks at it, and I'll leave it at that. Mike, anything to add to that stuff? The only thing I'd add, John, is that th th this is why this tool is so powerful, because you can see this information laid out before you. And if you don't understand what any of these items are on this sheet, 
Just go to Investopedia, which we uh, told you about in the resource list uh, previously, and look it up. And Investopedia will explain it to you in exquisite detail. Um, and so this this thing is so powerful and so helpful. Thank you, John. Yeah, and I'd add to that. The other reason it's powerful is, you know, if, if you don't know what you're doing, you just go through these tabs. And most of us, like this stuff, is easy to tackle, you know, as you go through these tabs. And then by going through those tabs and putting inputs in there, you finally click the income statement and it automatically is built. So that's much easier to to deal with if you're new to this than trying to build an income statement from scratch and understand how some of these calculations are made that you see in here. The tool takes the right, all, all that stuff right off the table. Again, consistent with how the rest of this works, it'll calculate years two and three in a more summary basis. It'll summarize year one for you here and then show you years two and three and um, you know project that for you. So I'm gonna stop there to say, the reason you wanna go back and forth left to right on this thing is the first time you look at the income statement, you might throw up on your computer screen there might be a big, huge negative number here, and there probably will be to, 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 to set your expectations. The first time you put your inputs in here, you're gonna look at the income statement and be short of breath, right? Like, oh my God, um, you know, I, I can't lose that much money. But guess what? Obviously, you can go back and change some of your assumptions about how many people you're gonna hire, how you're gonna price your product, uh, how, you know, what you're going to do for operating expenses. And the more you massage those numbers, the more the income statement will get in line with what you can live with. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the number one reason why you need to do this yourself. Without going through the process I just described, you're not going to have a firsthand knowledge of how the business works. It's not going to be baked in your DNA about, how sales pricing and how fast you're going to collect and how fast you're going to pay and how you're going to ramp up your operating expenses. Without doing this yourself, you're not going to have a firsthand appreciation for how those things uh, relate to one another. So let's go now to the next. Remember, the financial statements is three of them. We just looked at the first one, the income statement. We're now going to look at the next one, the cash flow statement. And this is calculating your cash flow. So um, this is what calculates, just to refresh your memory, down to the penny, what your actual cash going in and out of the business is every month. So just to orient you to this, a cash flow statement is designed in sections. The top section shows you cash coming into the business. This is based on your assumptions around getting paid by customers and um, anything related to um, Cash coming in, I'll leave it at that, right? So cash outflows involve anything related to the use of cash. So buying new fixed assets, uh, buying additional inventory, your cost of goods sold is, is, is reflected here automatically, right? And I've already defined what that is. The real monthly cost of your operating expenses and your payroll is, is put in here. Your payments uh, against your loans that you took out and anything related to financing, your credit card payments, things like that. If you pay yourself as an owner, that's going to be reflected in here, okay? You can model that as well. And what it does is subtracts the money coming in from the money going out to give you a net cash flow. So you're going to see both negative and positive numbers here. It is normal to see negative and positive numbers, folks. Don't freak out if you see negative numbers. Um, so what that's saying is in this month, it cost me $60,110 to operate the business. I had nothing coming in because it's month one. Guess what? I just burned $60,000. That 60000 literally went out the door. It's not coming back. Okay, so that's what this is actually reflecting. And the, one thing I don't like about this model is it was built so long ago. It, it's current and it works. They keep improving it. But it, the SBA assumes that you can just get a line of credit easily. So... You'll see this line called line of credit drawdown um, really reflects how much negative cash flow you have in the business. And what the very last line says, line of credit balance is, it adds up those deficits each month. So think about a credit card, for example. If you keep putting money on it, that credit card balance keeps going up, right? 
That's exactly what's being recorded here. And if you look at this, the worst it gets is $189,000, 614, based on the inputs I've had um, so far. Mike, I'm going to pause here and see if you got anything and then make the best point about this whole model next. Anything? Nothing to add, John. Thank you. All right, so this page you're looking at is the most important page in the whole model. This page is what you should use to really keep looking at to make adjustments throughout the rest of the model. Why? Because, folks, here's the drum roll. Without going through this exercise, this right here, here's the big secret, guys. This is your working capital need. Your working capital needs. Stomp your feet. This is a test question. So when, without going through the exercise I just showed you, you have no idea how much working capital you need. And this is why the second reason why companies go out of business, they don't go through this exercise. They wing it, figure it out when we get there. But sadly, entrepreneurs don't know how important this exercise is, and they don't know to do it. So clearly, we're telling you it's important, and you should do it. And the reason is by modeling your business like we just walked you through, it's the only way to accurately measure how much working capital you're going to need. Okay, that was the second step in the process. What's the third step? Add 10 to 15% to this number. Okay, so this is the most important sheet in the model because it measures, predicts what your working capital need is. And you don't have to be a genius to, to, to know that based on what I've said so far, the inputs you put into this and the assumptions you make drive what that is. Now, keep, keep your eye on this number, 189,614. There's a couple ways to think about minimizing this number, and some of you might have already picked up on it, okay? The first way is to change your assumptions about how cash comes in and out of the company. So we're going to go back to this additional inputs tab. So let me... Um, let me say, all right, I'm, I want to be more conservative and say that in the first year, only 60% of our customers are going to pay us, not 80% within the first 30 days. And then we're going to say 30% of them are going to pay us between 30 and 60 days and 10% more than 60 days. So when I go back to my cash flow statement, look what happens to that number. It went from 189 to 214. This is why this model is so cool. <laughs> If our customers pay us later than we think, we're going to run out of cash. And this model just showed you that, right? Instead of needing 189000 I really need $215,000 if most of my customers pay me later than what I assumed. And that happens in real life, folks, and that's why this model is so great. So what you want to do is you want to be ultra conservative in your assumptions on this particular page. And, okay, what's another way we can fix that? Or minimize that risk. Well, let's just say we're going to pay slower. We're going to pay 30%, um, 60% within 30 to 60, and 10% more than 60. Now I go back to my cash flow, and look, it got better. It's down to 201. Why? Because in the, in the real world, if you pay your vendors, wait to pay them, just like you do with your personal finances, you have more cash in the bank, don't you? Exactly the same principle. So this tool kills a lot of birds at one stone. It helps you make assumptions about how cash should flow in your business. It helps you think about pricing models to offer your customers to get cash in the door. It helps you set policies with your suppliers and what terms you're willing to live with or not. It does all those things. And folks, without going through this thought process and investing time to do it, you're not going to you got, it's not going to be in your bloodstream or in your DNA when you start your business. And that's why most of us get into trouble. Um, but let's just say we've done all we can and we still got a number here. <laughs> you know, we still got a cumulative deficit that peaks out at 201. Uh, that's probably what most of you are going to see. I don't think any one of you are going to have a model that doesn't require any working capital. If you do, you've got a problem in your model somewhere and have somebody look at it. So you're going to have a number there, folks. And remember, you want to add 10 to 15% of it. What you want to do is keep going back and forth, left to right in this model, to get it where you you can't do any more, and there's some number sitting there that you have to live with. So for simplicity's sake, let's just say we're looking at that number. It's $201,000. How do we turn that into zero? Well, 
for those of you that paid attention. Remember I had a blank here, right? Now I know I've gone through the process. Based on my planning and the assumptions I've made, I'm short $201,000. Remember, add 20 to 30% to that. So let's just make it 225. So I have to figure out how to bring in an extra or plan to bring in an extra $225,000 into my business. And I better have a plan for that before I start the business or I'm going to turn into that OSIS situation where you don't want to be. So I'm going to put $225,000 in this cell. So I've added that in the cell and I go back to my cash flow statement. There's the 225. That's now my beginning balance. Now, in reality, we might not actually bring the 225 in on month one, uh, but we need to have a plan for it for whenever we need it. Remember, in this model, I don't have any revenue coming in in the first three months. I'm probably going to need it right away. So unless I have access to $225,000, you might as well not even start the business. Now, look what happened to the bottom line. All those numbers go away. Why? Because we have enough cash to buffer our deficits to not cause us having to tap into that figurative line of credit, which is the cash we need. So just to summarize a few points. Number one, you go from left to right through this model. You figure out payroll, sales forecast, your additional inputs around accounts payable and receivable, your operating expenses. Spend some time on that. Think through that and all the thought process. Cringe and look at the income statement first. And you'll notice where we are with the model. I actually have, you know, net losses here for five months. That's normal to see, especially for a startup, right? Now, notice that if you look at the bottom here, if you can squint, the total of these losses is $198,000. And the mistake a lot of us make is we go off the income statement to say, hey, I just need $200,000 and I'll be good to go. Well, you're kind of right, but you're not factoring in how cash actually goes in and out of the business. For example, on the income statement, like I mentioned, you're not factoring in the principal payments on the loan, just the interest payment. So that's what the cash flow statement does. It adds that other stuff in there. So you really need 225, not 198, to keep yourself out of trouble. Um, but that's, again, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to put you to sleep. But I, hopefully I've given you a good orientation to how this model works and why it's so important. And without using this tool or some of the other tools that I'll mention in a minute, um, without spending time on that, you're, you're going to be winging it, folks, and you're going to run into that working capital problem that nips you in the bud and uh, causes most businesses to crash. The last thing I'll say before asking Mike for any wisdom is just to keep reiterating, that's when you want to apply your money if you have it. You may not have $225,000, but when you go to get the two twenty-five, dollars that's when you say you're going to put the fifty dollars that you have or the $10,000 you have towards that. It helps you get that number secured from that funding source before you need it on friendlier terms than they're going to provide to you when you absolutely have no other choice for the same amount of money. Mike, anything to add to that? Well, I guess what I'd add, John, is that this tool is applicable whether you're a startup, a franchise, or buying an existing business. You can change these numbers around to suit what you're getting into and, and be appropriate for the method by which you're getting into business. And th that's an important distinction about this tool. You just change the inputs around, and uh, that will help you calculate uh, what working capital, startup capital, and working capital that you're going to need. So this is just powerful, powerful stuff that did not exist when John and I got into business. And um, it, it's it's such a helpful tool. And three months, four months, five months down the road, if you need help with this thing. Uh, let us know, and we'll be happy to help you with it. Thank you, John. Yeah, so a couple more things just to round this out. There's other sh tabs here that you see. Just like everything else, it's got cash flow forecast for years one through three as well. 
But really, you're going to use cash flow for year one in most cases uh, to figure out what that working capital number is. But it does forecast cash flow out to the next few years. It also calculates a balance sheet. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. You're not really going to look at this um, so much. It also has these other tabs that have that are coded green that have some great little tools. It'll automatically calculate something called your break even. Uh, you can check that out. It also has financial ratios, which are somewhat important. You can, you can look into ratios. Uh, it'll calculate those ratios. Ratios are very useful to see over time and compare your ratios to other businesses like yours. And that's a whole other module but it does calculate that for you. It also gives you this tool, which I think is pretty neat. It's a diagnostic tool. Um, so if you go down this findings list, it automatically populates some feedback on your model, uh, whether this seems reasonable, whether it's within range, or you know this like example interest rate may be too low for the type of loan requested. <laughs> so it provides you some automated feedback on your model. I like this tab a lot. Uh, so this helps you think through some of the adjustments you want to go back and make and keep checking this as well. And I already covered these two tabs um, as well. So it's a very powerful tool. It is um, an example of a, a tool that you have to use to calculate working capital. Um, a lot of entrepreneurship programs don't talk about working capital like a bunch of nerds like we do. But it, if you, it's the one thing that's going to kill your business. It kills most businesses. Don't be afraid of the fact that you're going to need working capital. Every business needs it. But, you know, invest the time into calculating it and coming up with a plan to um, deal with it when it happens so that you're not left on your uh, on your heels when it happens.